This video was a lot easier to make a few days ago. Now we have to wade through the inevitable comments about the OnePlus 6T, even though it officially doesn't come out until this coming Tuesday, and then who freaking knows when it'll finally come to South Africa. It looks like a really strong competitor that is priced like a champ. We'll definitely keep that in mind as we move forward in this video, but since we haven't had it to try ourselves, we'll have to only keep some speculation about the phone in mind. So let's talk about the iPhone XR, 10R, tenor, however we might want to pronounce it. It's actually an interesting smartphone. It has some specs that make it more compelling than its predecessor, the iPhone 8 Plus, as well as the iPhone 10, but also some specs that make it a step backwards. The lack of a full HD screen with only a resolution of 1792 by 828, the massive bezels, the LCD liquid retina makeup versus OLEDs on the market, the single rear camera, and those massive bezels. It creates for an Apple experience that I'm not quite sure how to understand. There are parts of this phone that enthrall me, and then there are aspects that leave me wanting to sell it and head back to my Pixel 2 XL. I suppose the point of this video will be me trying to convince myself whether or not I wanna keep this phone as my daily driver or stick with the cheaper iPhone 10 slash Pixel 2 XL. What I don't have to convince myself of, however, is whether or not to use today's sponsor, Ting. Ting is a mobile phone carrier in the United States that does things a little differently. They have no startup fees, no contracts, no plans, and you only pay for what you use. Prior to me moving here to South Africa, I was actually on Ting as a way of saving money because I didn't want to enroll myself into a contract when I knew that I was leaving the country, and I was trying to just, you know, save for a move, obviously. And when we had Ting, our average bill split between my wife and I was about $48. So we were spending about $24 per person on our Ting bill. And if you wanna see how much your average Ting bill will be, you can go to their website calculator, input how many minutes and text messages and data you use, and then you'll see what you can save by switching to Ting. They have nationwide LTE coverage, which means you'll have great network coverage from coast to coast using T-Mobile and Sprint, and almost every single phone works with Ting. So whether it's that you know Motorola Razr that you have in your closet from a thousand years ago and you want your kids to get signed up, or it's the brand new iPhone 10R, or even the Huawei Mate 20 Pro, you can get those signed up on Ting, no problem. And best of all, they have reliable customer service, so if you ever need any help, you can call them, they'll answer you within two rings and you'll speak to an actual human, not just uh, a robot who's gonna put you through a call tree. And fun fact, they have Discord customer service for all you uh, people who are on Discord. We'll leave a link for their Discord customer service in the video description if you're at all interested. So my friends, if you're interested in signing up for Ting, you can use the link in the video description, ufd.ting.com to sign up for free and save $25 off your bill or get $25 in credit to a phone on the Ting shop. Again, that's ufd.ting.com. Link for that will be in the video description as well as in the pinned comment. Comment. Sign up if you're interested. They're a great carrier in the US. I can't actually recommend them enough. I love them when we were on them and the fact that they save you so much money and they do things a little bit differently than how the mobile phone industry does it is a great thing. So check them out. So it's clear from the get-go that the 10R is not a full upgrade from either the 10 or the Pixel 2. It's not priced as a full flagship with it starting at $750. So we're not trying to answer whether you should switch from your 10 or Pixel but rather taking it from the perspective of if you're a buyer in the market who has about $700 to spend on a phone since the Pixel 2 XL has seen a price drop to $700 on the Google store from its previous $850. And the 10 should be selling for a similar price out on the open market once retailers or your friend with an, a compulsive Apple upgrade disorder decides to clear stock on the one generation old phone. Obviously, $750 is a lot of money to spend on a phone. So even if the device isn't technically a flagship, in my mind, it has to be super close for me to even consider dropping that kind of money. So I think I'd like to start off with the negatives first, just to establish those traits upfront in case you're concerned about the trade-offs that it has. So let's start with the bezels. My goodness, these bezels. It is the most obvious thing about the phone when you get it. And I'm not talking about the top or bottom chins. It's the thick side black bars that just pop out at you. The Pixel obviously also suffers from speaker chins, but I don't know if it's because I'm used to the Pixel itself or other phones just needing that space for speakers and cameras before the notch trend, but the top and bottom bars don't strike me as a visual problem. 
The side wrap, however, seems particularly intrusive on the 10R, especially when Apple is promoting the display as being edge to edge, just like the new iPad Pros. I know that Apple really likes to reinvent terms such as liquid retina instead of calling their displays an LCD, so it seems like they've returned the word bezel into the word edge because I see a lot of edge on the 10R, even with the 6.1 inches of screen real estate. There's a fence that keeps it from actually reaching the outside of the phone. The more I pay attention to it, the more I notice it and the more it bothers me. But if I just use the phone like normal, I forget they're there. Just like the notch, we can discuss how it's a visual blight on phones, but when you're actually engaged with the device for a while, you forget that it's present. The other negative that I have against the 10R is its speakers. It has top and bottom firing speakers, so you can hear it similarly from almost every angle. Although it irks me a bit that the bottom speakers are down firing instead of front facing. Although that's not what I have against them. It's the lack of depth to the sound that misses the mark here. There's great detail and clarity throughout the volume range, but it lacks any sort of low end. Bass heavy songs and videos with hosts who have deeper voices lose a lot of detail at the bottom end of the spectrum. And they cause some audio experiences to feel hollow. I particularly noticed it when listening to the latest 21 Pilots album, Trench. The driving bass lines are a key experience on that album, and the 10R made the songs feel flat and weak, and I actually wouldn't enjoy the band if I was listening to it on this phone for the first time. The Pixel 2 definitely has a better bass response, even if it loses a bit of detail in the mid and high ends, but the overall sound is much more preferable. The 10 unfortunately suffers from most of the same issues as the 10R, and it appears that Apple has done little, if nothing, to change things up. The 10 appears to be slightly fuller than the new version, but overall they're similar in their disappointing lack of substance. And the last issue I need to bring up is the camera. It's not that the camera has issues or looks bad. In fact, it consistently placed in the middle of the pack when comparing it between the iPhone 10, Pixel 2 XL, and the Galaxy S9 Plus, more expensive phones at launch. So the overall quality is okay, even if it still tends to give photos an overly warm tone and a little bit of extra saturation. It's actually not as egregious as the 10. It's the software limits that Apple has decided to place on the portrait mode for the 10R. Obviously, since they dropped down to one camera on this phone, they had to resort to software identification in order to properly detect foreground subjects versus the background but they've restricted it to only work on human faces. Trying the portrait mode on my dog, on tech products, or anything besides a person results in a normal photo and doesn't provide that extra pop that you can get out of the portrait mode. The iPhone 10 obviously doesn't have this limitation because of its second camera, but Google has really nailed it with the single camera experience here. If you look at the picture on the screen, you can see the edge detection isn't perfect on inanimate objects with the Pixel 2's camera, but it's pretty close to be good enough in most instances and can be flawless if you have the shot set up properly. Take for instance this picture of a motherboard with its box and then this one with the motherboard by itself. Getting the subjects properly framed and lit can give you a really great photo from just the Pixel 2 smartphone camera. So considering I find myself taking more photos of inanimate objects more often than not, having the portrait mode available at all times has something that I wasn't fully aware I used as much as I do until it was taken away from me with the 10R. It's sorely missing and it could likely be added by Apple in a future firmware upgrade, but I find the chances of that happening pretty slim. However, the portrait mode, when it does work, is actually really stunning. What Apple has managed to do with the single camera and the neural engine on the new A12 chip can provide some really exceptional details when it comes to getting edge detection mostly right, and then the proper amount of blur to separate the foreground from the background. Take this picture of two of my sons. It messes up some of the hairs closer to the back of his head, but the general outline is actually really solid. It separates them incredibly well and has to be one of my favorite pics I have of my kids from a phone. And it consistently does this. This is not the best picture that I just chose out of a bunch. There's something really good about the software implementation that Apple has here. So you may have noticed that I switched over to giving the 10R positive praise, and that's because those are the only major downfalls that I personally see with the phone. Some of you might be asking about the screen resolution. It's only 828 pixels wide, and the iPhone 10 has 40% more pixels per inch, the Pixel 2 XL has 65% more, and the 10R has to be worse. But, but, honestly, if I wasn't told the physical specs of the screens, 
I wouldn't notice it. I normally use my phone about a foot and a half away from my face because that's how long my forearm is, which is far away enough for me to not see any sort of discrepancies in pixel density. Text is clear enough videos look crisp. I have no complaints that the screen is less than full HD on this thing. I never really thought I was getting a better experience on my Pixel 2 XL just because it has 1440p. In fact, my trade-off will always be that I'm okay taking a slightly lower resolution in exchange for battery life every time. Obviously, if you're a resolution seeker, you notice the fine adjustments in text clarity, you want the most detail in your phone screen, then the 828p 10R would be a disappointment to you. For me, as someone who doesn't keep my phone anywhere within a foot of my face, the diminishing returns of a higher resolution screens happens around the 720p range. So anything above 720p is good enough for me. And while we're here, let's talk about LCD versus OLED. Obviously, to have the best contrast for your screen, OLED is the way to go because you get pure black on images with no backlight. There's no denying that. However, the LCD on the 10R is actually impressively good. It has support for the P3 color gamut, same as the 10, so its color accuracy is incredibly impressive. The backlight is also less than noticeable in most normal lighting conditions during the day. At night, in a darker room, you're going to notice that black pixels are actually being illuminated, but that comes with the trade-off that you won't have the blue shift that comes with an OLED when you view it off axis. OLED panels vary, and some have more blue shift than others, but it's there on all of them. However, let's talk about brightness because that's where the 10R shines. It pushes 625 nits. That is surprisingly bright. Compare that to the 574 nits on the iPhone 10 and the 438 nits on the Pixel 2 XL, and you have a screen that is more like a flashlight in the dark and can compete for attention with the sun. And while the phone could definitely have better battery life if it had an OLED panel, panel because it wouldn't have to display all of the pixels all of the time or waste energy on a backlight. It's actually by far the best battery life out of all three phones that I have with me right now. While it doesn't have the biggest battery of the bunch, that honor goes to the Pixel 2 XL, its lower resolution screen and more efficient 7 nanometer A12 processor means that it makes the most out of the 2,942 milliamp hour battery. The Pixel might come in with 40% more battery at 3,500 milliamp hours, but that 1440p screen sucks the juice pretty quickly. Not enough to mean that you can't get through a day on typical use use case, but the iPhone XR just lasts. I accidentally forgot to charge the phone one night while working on this video, and while I couldn't go the next full day without the charge, I didn't have to worry about charging it immediately to get through my morning. I usually get up at around 4.30, so to have my phone last till 11 a.m. the next day without charging during active use and hours spent in messaging apps is a completely different conversation than what I experienced with the 10 or the Pixel. And then let's spend a brief second on performance. Out of the three phones, the 10R is the fastest. The A12 chip is not only just better than the A11 and the iPhone 10 and the, the Snapdragon 835 and the Pixel, but it also throttles the least out of all of the phones that we have in the office. Its default score in 3D Mark was higher than the other two phones, but then after 10 runs when the phone was nice and toasty from benchmarking for a solid hour, its lowest score was tied with the Pixel 2 at peak conditions. Over 10 runs, the Pixel 2 XL saw an 18% drop in performance, and the iPhone 10 was closer to the 19% mark. The iPhone XR only saw a performance drop of 11%. So not only did Apple put a much faster chip into its more affordable phone, but the 10R is designed in such a way to dissipate the heat properly and see less performance degradation over the long term, meaning a phone gaming session is going to go better on the 10R if you're playing for long periods of time. So go enjoy RuneScape Mobile in peace now that it's finally available. So I mentioned at the beginning of the video that this video was going to be my way of fleshing out which phone I wanted to use moving forward. The Pixel 2 XL, already won out over the iPhone 10 way back when, which is why I gave it to Reese. And the S9 Plus found a similar fate and made it into Tank's hands. But now, I'm actually really torn. The biggest thing that's stopping me from just wholeheartedly taking the leap to the 10R is the fact that the camera is so limited on anything besides people. But the battery life, the general performance, the snappiness of Face ID, and general picture quality kind of has me sold on this phone. And even though I'm not 100% confident on the move, I'm going to be using the 10R for my daily driver from here on out. 
The Pixel 2 still has its merits though. The better camera, the higher resolution screen, $50 cheaper price tag, and lack of a notch will likely be selling points to many of you. And so the Pixel 2 could be the one that you should go with it just depends. The iPhone 10, however, I think just loses in all counts. The only win that I could give the original $1,000 Apple flagship is the fact that its screen looks so gosh dang good and then the portrait mode for inanimate objects due to the second camera on the back. But other than that, it seems like Apple jammed all of the same features into the 10R and improved them to make the 10 fully obsolete. So it's no wonder why Apple dropped them from their store altogether. If you can find a sale this holiday season on the 10 for about $600, then it actually becomes tempting to me. Otherwise, it's between these two phones, hands down. All of this is, of course, only until Tuesday when the OnePlus 6T comes out, and then I might have to change my mind. But what do you all think? Are you keen on the iPhone 10R? Does its $750 price tag and similar performance to the iPhone 10 make you wanna get it? Are you not down with the Apple scene just because of uh, them being Apple? I wanna hear what you're thinking about this phone right here. Also, just wanna say big thanks to Ting for sponsoring this video. Again, don't forget to go to ufd.ting.com to save $25 off your bill or a phone on their shop in Ting Credit. UFD.ting.com, link for that will be in the description. Anyways, I'm gonna wrap this video up there. I wanna thank you guys for watching what is a our first phone video in like three years. So we really appreciate that you decided to check this one out. We're planning on doing some more phone content going forward, so be sure to let us know down in the comments what phones you want us to check out, what phone videos you're interested in that maybe nobody else is covering. We wanna hear from you. Don't forget to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video. Please get subscribed to stay up to date on all of our tech-related content. I'm Brett with the UFD Tech Channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see your smiling faces again in the next video.